work problems for chapter five. This is the thermodynamics chapter. Uh, so my references here were Brown and LeMay's chemistry text, uh, Zumdahl's chemistry, uh, to some extent McMurray and Fay chemistry, and also Mr. Max AP website. And the answers to the problems here are provided by myself. Next slide, next slide, next slide. So the first problem, and again, I want to remind you, as I said in the lecture notes for this chapter, the, I mean, probably, almost certainly, you're not going to really understand how all of this stuff ties together. So what you'll have to do is just like content yourself with that knowledge and just try to learn how to do individual problems. If you really want to understand thermodynamics, you're going to have to like go through it in a more detailed class than what we're going to get in this chapter or in the chapter in 1412. It's something that it's, it's like a lot of stuff and it's complicated. <clears throat> so don't be discouraged if you don't understand how all this stuff ties together. Just concentrate for this class on just trying to learn how to work the problems. And then if you want to pursue it further, you can <clears throat> later. So what is the difference between the internal energy and the enthalpy? And the answer is internal energy is different uh, if you add the work term to the internal energy, you get the enthalpy. So the delta E is just the energy. The delta H is going to be the energy plus the work. The one that's measured at constant pressure is going to be Q sub P, which is going to be delta H. <clears throat> so delta H is going to be the same thing as Q sub P. Let me just write that real quick. I, I usually try not to write very much because this little thing I'm writing with is so inefficient, but Q sub P is delta H. So these are both path functions. And then <clears throat> constant volume would be Q sub V, the heat at constant volume, which is the same thing as delta E. So this one is delta H. It just drives me up the walls to try to write with this thing. And then the Q sub V, that's supposed to be a V there, not an R. <clears throat> is delta E. So again, that delta makes all the difference. When you have E or H, they're state functions. When you put that delta in front of the E or the H, it becomes a path. Q sub V is a constant volume. That means that you can't change the volume. So that means you have to have some kind of a container that you bolt the lid down on. That doesn't happen very much. So most of the problems are going to be like this, where you have constant pressure. Uh, next slide. These are the answers here, so I'll let you look at this on your own. Uh, it's just the same thing I just said. Uh, next slide. All right, so here we have our first problem, uh, so first real problem. Uh, so what we're doing is we're adding H2 to CC double bond. So we're going to take that thing right there and convert it to CH3, CH3. So this is CH2, CH2. The way it is, we're going to add H2 to it. All right, so we started off with a total of 100 milliliters of stuff reactants. 50 milliliters of H2 and 50 milliliters of ethylene. Now the change in the volume is going to be important because we are going to do the work here is minus P delta V. So minus the pressure, the piece of pressure, and then the delta V is the change in volume. <clears throat> and that's what we're supposed to be doing here is we're supposed to be figuring out what the work is. So remember we said um, work is force times distance, right, in physics. But in this chapter, and it would also be true if you were taking physics, we do it differently because we have different things available to measure, especially the volumes and the, um, that didn't come out very good, so very well. So that's supposed to be delta V. I was probably thinking about what I was going to say next when I wrote that. It's minus P delta V. <clears throat> So the volume is something we can measure and also the pressure. The pressure here is constant. So they put this under 1.5 atmospheres of pressure. So we're supposed to find the work. So the formula for work in thermodynamics in this chapter is minus P pressure times the change in volume. The change in volume here, well, we're going from 100 when we have the reactants, which that's the 50 plus the 50, and we're going to 50 where that's all we have for products. So that's actually minus 50 milliliters or minus <clears throat> 0.05 liters. Where again, I'm 
doing what I always do. I'm just immediately converting things to the units that we're going to need them to be in. So it's <clears throat> minus 0 0.05 liters, and that's going to be multiplied times minus 1.5 atmospheres, which when you do that, you get plus, um, let's see, it would be 0 0.075 which I'm not going to write that out, but it's going to be uh, 0.075 liter atmospheres. And then there's a conversion factor to get us from that um, <clears throat> over to um, the units that we really want, which are joules. And the conversion factor would have to be given to you. So we have 0.075 liter atmospheres. We multiply that by 101, actually. So it actually turns out to be 7.6 joules, and we'll see that on the answer slide next. All right, so uh, our delta V, our change in volume, is going to go from 100 milliliters to 50 milliliters, where we got the 100, where we added 50 and 50 here. So the reactants were 50 mils of, uh, milliliters of H2 and 50 milliliters of ethylene. So we had 50 plus 50 for the reactants. So we uh, to get the change in volume, uh, we subtract what we started with minus what we ended up with, which was 50. So it would be 50 milliliters, but it's minus because it's getting smaller. <clears throat> the volume is getting smaller. So uh, delta V is minus 50 milliliters, which is the same thing as minus 0 0.05 liters. Right, okay, so again, the formula for work, as we said in the lecture notes, it's minus P delta V, where P is 1.5 atmospheres. So when we multiply the minus times the minus, we get a plus, and we get 0.075 liter atmospheres. But that's not the unit we really want here. We want it in joules, because, and I'll probably say this a whole bunch more during the semester, but what we want for units for either energy or work is joules because work and energy are just two different forms of the same thing. You can use energy to do work. So we want the units to be in joules. Joules from physics is kilogram meters squared per second squared. So when we multiply this by 101 joules per liter atmosphere, we get about 7.6 joules. All right, we're going to need this for the next part of this problem. So let's go ahead and go to the next part. Remember, this is going to be our work term. Uh, this is our amount of PV work, and we've already multiplied by a minus. Next slide. So the second part of this wants us to figure out what uh, the value of delta E is, where the delta E is going to equal Q plus W, but we just figured out the W part of that in the previous uh, problem. We decided that that was 7.6 joules, and it was plus. So the work part we can go ahead and write in is plus 7.6 joules. Now, the next part is a little tricky. So remember that I said in the lecture notes that whenever you see uh, Q sub P or delta H, if you're at constant pressure, which we are here, we're at constant pressure because it's telling us that the pressure is a constant 1.5 atmospheres. So if you're at constant pressure, I said that the Q sub P and the delta H are the same thing. Or in other words, this Q, which we're get, we could write this as Q sub P if we wanted to because it's at constant pressure. Uh, so when they tell us that the delta H is minus 0.31 kilojoules, which is the same thing as minus 310 joules, right? So let me just write that down. Then that is going to be the same thing as our Q. So if we come back over here, uh, delta E equals, whoops, equals, Q plus W, and this is the first law. This is what we were saying before. So what I'm circling right now is the first law, delta E is Q plus W. We figured out what the W was for this problem in the previous problem, and the Q part of it is gonna be the same thing as the delta H here. It's minus 310 joules. So we would just add minus 310 plus 7.6. And the reason I changed it from kilojoules to joules here is because we want everything to be in the same units. So we want this in joules and this in joules. We could do it for kilojoules, make them both kilojoules, but it's just easier to see it this way. So it's about minus 310 plus about 7 or 8. So it's going to be about minus 302 when you add those together, and that's going to be your answer. 
<coughs> excuse me. All right, next slide. And here we have our answer. It's actually minus 302.4, which if you round this to uh, two sig figs, you get minus 0. Point, well, it would be minus, uh, let's see. Yeah, it's actually easier to write this in kilojoules, so it'd be minus 0 0.30 kilojoules, and we're keeping that last zero there as a significant figure. Again, I don't really worry about sig figs on your exams unless it's specifically supposed to be a problem that's for significant figure calculations. And then also notice here that because this is a negative number here, this whole process is exothermic. Next slide. Given 400 grams of iced tea, or I'm sorry, given 400 grams of hot tea at 80 degrees centigrade, what mass of ice must be added to obtain iced tea at 10 degrees? So first of all, uh, we're adding ice, <clears throat> so we can't just use the formula that we did before in the problems that we were doing in the lecture notes and uh, figure out, you know, the mass times the specific heat times the temperature. So oh, this time we're actually told what the temperature is going to be at the end of the day. It's going to be 10 degrees. So we're starting at zero degrees for the ice because ice is going to be at zero degrees unless you're told, told otherwise. And here we're told that it's at zero degrees anyway. <clears throat> and we are given hot T at 80 degrees. So the delta T for the hot T is going to be minus 70 degrees centigrade because you're changing from 80 degrees to 10 degrees. So that's minus 70. And the delta T for the ice water, which we're, we don't have yet, will be plus 10 degrees because you're going from 0 to 10. But before we can raise the temperature of the ice water from 0 to 10, we have to first melt the ice. So for the part that has to do with the ice here, we're going to have to do two things. We have to melt the ice, and that's where this heat of fusion comes in here. This is to melt the ice. And then we have to raise the temperature of the ice water or the water at zero degrees from zero to 10. So it's going to be two steps. All right. So the amount of heat that is given off by the hot tea is going to equal the amount of heat gained by the ice and then to heat that up to 10 degrees. So what you can do is you can go ahead and figure out what this amount is going to be at the very beginning and then set it equal to the amount that you're going to have to have of energy that's going to be gained by your ice. And they're both going to be given in joules. Um, and they're going to be the same amount in terms of the number, but the signs will be different. So multiply for your T, you're going to use your specific heat here as the same as if it were water, which is 4.18 joules per uh, gram C. So you would multiply 4.18 times 400 grams times minus 70 degrees centigrade. And whatever you get for that, the ice part will be the same number, but it'll be plus. <clears throat> it will be gaining the heat. Then for the ice part, you have to do two things. You have to melt the ice. <clears throat> to do that, the specific, uh, the, the uh, heat of fusion is 6,010 joules per mole, where I'm just converting it right off the bat from kilojoules to joules, just because we're going to need it in that unit anyway. So let's just do it at the very beginning. So if you want, you can just move this decimal place over three places to the right, and you'll get 6,010 joules per mole. <clears throat> but that's per mole. We don't want to do it that way, but we want it in grams because we need to figure out the number of grams. So every um, mole of water weighs 18 grams. So what you can do is you can convert this from joules per mole to joules per gram by writing a conversion factor here of one mole, which I'm just going to write that as M if that's OK, uh, per 18 grams, because that's how much water weighs. It's 18 grams per mole. Now you say, wait a minute, you wrote it upside down. <clears throat> yeah, but as we said before, that's OK. It's a conversion factor. So it's just like you're multiplying by one when you multiply by either 18 grams per mole or one mole per 18 grams, because it's the same thing. The 18 grams, if you're dealing with water, is the same thing as one mole of water. <clears throat> so it's just like dividing one by one, which is one, and you can multiply by one. So that means that whether we write it as 18 grams per mole or one mole per 18 grams it, it is equivalent. But if we do it this way, 
or actually, yeah, if we do it this way, then the moles here on top on this side are going to cancel the moles here on the bottom on this side. So we're going to wind up with joules per gram, which is what we want. <clears throat> Um, and so that's actually going to give us basically uh, the delta H effusion in joules per gram. So what we're going to wind up with is some unknown number of grams, which I'm just going to call X, multiplied by 6,010 uh, joules. Now, whatever you get when you divide 6,010 by 18 uh, per gram times X grams. And that's to melt it. And then plus... 4.18 times 10 times um, X. So I'm not going to write all that out because it just takes so long. But So 4.18 times 10 is 41.8 X. So I will, I'll will just write 42 X because it's about that. So 42 X plus uh, whatever you get when you divide 6,010 by 18 X <clears throat> is going to equal, and then it's going to be the uh, negative of whatever the number was that we got for the hot tea. So let's go to the next slide so we can actually look at some numbers. So to cool the tea, the hot tea, from 80 to 10, we multiply the specific heat of the tea, which is the same as water, times 400 grams, which was the mass they gave us up here, times minus 70. And you get 117,040 joules when you multiply those. And it's negative. So for the ice, it's going to be the same number. It's still going to be 117,040, but it's going to be plus. Okay, and that's going to equal the amount of heat it takes to melt the ice, and then the amount of heat it takes to raise the ice from uh, the water from zero to ten degrees. So we come up here with the same thing I said before. When you divide 6,010 by 18, um, you get 333.9 joules per gram. And then when you multiply that by X and then add uh, 41.8 X, then that has to equal 117,040, but it's plus 117,040. So we're going to get 333.9 X plus 41.8 X equals 117,040. Once you get it to that point, you're basically finished because you just then you're just doing algebra. So you don't really have to think about it. I mean, hopefully you don't. So we end up here with one equation and one unknown. Right. So we should be able to solve. And in fact, we can. So 333.9x plus 41.8x equals 117,040. And then just combine your terms here. And you end up with 375x equals 117,040. We'll do a lot of problems this semester like this. So you, if you're not good at algebra, you'll want to try to review that a little bit. Um, we're just solving for x. And so to do that, if you have an equation like this, to solve that for x, you divide both sides by the 375.7, and you'll get your answer. So divide this side by 375.7, and then the 375.7s cancel. And then divide this side over here by 375.7, and you get 311 grams. Now, on a test, you probably, if you have time, want to go back and check that. And the way you would check it would be just to substitute that in, like here. So substitute in 311 here and here and see if you get the right answer. All right, next slide. All right, here we have uh, a two-part, two-step oxidation. And so what they want us to do is find the delta H of formation of SO3. In other words, for this thing. So it just turns out that in order to get SO3 here from its elements, <clears throat> we would have to add an S and three O's, right? So an S plus three O's would give us SO3. Is that right? Yeah. Three O's. That's not 30, it's three O's. That's oxygen. So one S plus three oxygens is going to give us SO3. And so what we're supposed to do is we're supposed to find a way to add these two things together to get this, which let me just finish it. So if we add S plus three O's, we get SO3. So that would be the heat of formation or the enthalpy of formation for the SO3. So the idea here, and this one is an easy one to start with, 
is somehow we have to add these two things together. These two right here have to add together. So these are not the final reaction we're looking for. This is the final reaction we're looking for. And I actually had to write it in because they didn't give it to us. But they'll usually give it to you. So uh, here they didn't because they figured you probably can figure out that if you're forming SO3, you're going to need three O's um, and so forth. Okay, but if you think of O here, let's let's rewrite this O here. Um, if we rewrote this as O2, then we would want to have three halves O2, because if you multiply three halves times two, you get three. And so because this is going to actually be written as O2 rather than O, let's just go ahead and write this as three halves O2. So that's what we're going to need. Now, in this particular problem, we're not going to spend a lot of time on it because it's just a real simple problem. Because it turns out if you just add these exactly the way they are here, these two things, you're going to get exactly what you want. Because if you add these, you're going to get on the left S plus O2 plus SO2 plus a half O2. And on the right, you're going to get SO2 plus SO3. But the SO2 here is going to cancel with the one over here. So you're going to be left with S plus 3 halves O2 gives SO3. And that's exactly what we're looking for. So because we didn't have to make any changes, and I, what I mean is we didn't have to multiply through by any numbers, or we didn't have to reverse the direction of the reaction, then we didn't make any changes over here either. So to get the delta H for the overall reaction, you just add this delta H right here to this delta H right here. In other words, you add about minus 300 to about minus 100, you're going to get about minus 400. So it's going to be like minus 395 kilojoules or something like that. Next. And you can see that that is exactly what it is here. So in this particular problem, all we have to do is add this to this and we get our answer. But you should be aware that it usually won't work that way because they'll usually give you problems where you'll either have to reverse the direction and write it as SO2 giving S plus O2, or in order to get it to come out right, you may have to do that, or you may have to multiply through all of these things by some number like two, three, or four, or a half, or something like that. Or you may have to multiply through by a negative number. So we'll watch for that as we go along. Next slide. Okay, this one's a little more complicated because we've got more detailed stuff here and harder numbers. Uh, so what we want to remember here is our formula where if we want to know what the delta H of a reaction is, like this reaction right here, then it's going to be the delta H of formation of the products, which in this case is just one product, uh, minus the delta H of formations of the two reactants. So here they... Uh, switched it up on us and they gave us the delta H of the reaction, which usually, you know, that's what you would be figuring out by using the other two things. So what they didn't tell us was this. So what we're going to have to do is figure out what the delta H formation is for that one. The, you want to keep this simple in your mind. So here's the formula we're going to be using where delta H of reaction is delta H products minus delta H of reactants. The delta H of reaction is this right here. Delta H of products is this, so we can actually go ahead and substitute those in, and we'll do that on the next slide. And then the delta H of reactants will be this plus this, but since this is a negative, it's actually this minus this over here, this one. So let's go ahead now, keep that in mind. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, and so what I did here at uh, the bottom under the answer is I just used the same formula. And I went ahead and I substituted in the things that we already know. We already know the 57.5 and we already knew the 313.6 from the problem statement and the 239 we'll get to in just a minute. So what I did first of all was I figured out what is the delta H of the reactants. Uh, so I used this value right here and I used um, the value for uh, this one here. Uh, I used those two to figure out what the delta H of the reactants is first, this part. And then what I'm going to do is once I know what that is, and I've found that that is minus 256 kilojoules, 
and to get that I just took the value here for the products and minus a minus 57.5 <clears throat> so I'm just basically I'm just using this equation right here substituting in for delta H of reaction delta H of products and that's allowing me to figure out what delta H of reactants is all right so the delta H of reactants <clears throat> is minus 256 kilojoules and it equals the delta H of formation of that and the delta H of form formation for that and we know <clears throat> what the delta H of formation is um, for the let's see is it the, yeah the methanol so we know what the delta H of formation is for that one. So we know that if we subtract the delta H of formation for this one from the value that we got for the reactants in total, it's going to give us our answer. So minus 256 minus a minus 239, which is the value that we have here for methanol, which winds up being minus 256 plus 239, which winds up being negative 16.9 kilojoules, that's going to be the delta H of formation for this thing over here, the 2-methylpropane. All right, so if this looks difficult to you, it isn't difficult at all. It's just you just have to keep your numbers straight because all you're doing is adding up and subtracting. So just keep your numbers and your compounds straight. So the hard part about this one is just all of these long formulas. So just like kind of ignore them as much as you can in fact that's why I wrote the names down here so if you want you can just put the numbers with the names here and you don't have to worry about the formulas N next slide all right when 1.5 grams of magnesium is allowed to react with 200 milliliters of water or no of HCl the temperature rises from 25 degrees to 42.9 degrees so that's about 18 degrees that it's rising we're supposed to find delta H for the reaction and then they're giving us the heat capacity for the calorimeter and the specific heat of the final solution so to find delta h in kilojoules for the reaction we need to know what the reaction is so i wrote that here for you but this is the kind of thing you'd have to be able to supply on your own on a test so it would be magnesium plus 2hcl and so we have to balance this gives you magnesium chloride plus H2. So, I mean, all of this um, is going to be stuff you'd have to come up with on your own. And it's kind of a lot, really. But <clears throat> all you really know from reading the problem statement is that you're adding magnesium to HCl. So what you'd have to do to write out the rest of this reaction, as I did here, would be to figure out what's going to happen if you react magnesium with HCl. And I mean, hopefully by the time you get through this class, you'll understand that if you do that, the HCl will react with the magnesium and produce magnesium chloride. And it's going to leave you with H left over that will form into H2. But then you want to make sure that it's balanced. So I've already done all of that for you, but just be aware you'd have to probably do that on your own. <clears throat> now, once you have it balanced here, what you want to do is you want to compare what you would have for the magnesium here. So let's look and see how many moles we have of the magnesium in our balanced equation. And it turns out we have one mole of it because there's a one here. It isn't actually written, but it's implied. So we're going to need one mole of magnesium. So just be aware that when we did this part up here at the top, we only used 1.5 grams of magnesium. But magnesium has an atomic mass of 24.3, so that's not even close to a whole mole. So the amount of heat that we figure out here, which we'll do that in just a minute, is not going to be the same as it would be for down here. Because the amount of heat that we're doing up here is just for 1.5 grams of magnesium. But we need to figure out what it would be if we had one mole of magnesium, or in other words, of 24.3 grams of magnesium. <clears throat> all right, so let's first of all figure out how much heat we have up here for 1.5 grams of magnesium. So we multiply as before, we're going to be multiplying the mass of the solution, which in this case, uh, we're going to assume that the mass of this solution is 200 grams here. Well, we have 200, we have 200 milliliters, uh, but they're saying that the density of the solution with the magnesium in it, and I'm reading down here, is one gram per milliliter and when you mix in this 1.5 grams of magnesium into 200 milliliters you're still going to have 200 milliliters uh, it's just that the magnesium is going to be dissolved in that 200 milliliters so 
we're going to assume that that 200 milliliters will weigh 200 grams. So our mass is going to be 200 grams. Uh, specific heat is going to be 4.18. And the delta T will be uh, actually 17.9 or about 18 degrees. So we'll multiply those three things together, 200 times 17.9 times 4.18. And that is going to give us the amount of heat that was produced by 1.5 gram of magnesium. And then what we can do is we can set up a ratio and proportion where we're comparing 1.5 grams with 24.3 grams equals and then we can put the heat that was given off by 1.5 grams and then write x for the amount of heat that was given off by one mole next slide. so uh when we do this oh and uh, we also have to do the calorimeter uh so there's another step in here so in addition to multiplying the 4.18 times the 200 grams times the 17.9 we also have to multiply the 17.9 times the heat capacity for the calorimeter which was given here in the problem statement is 776 so the total amount of heat that's going to be given off when we react 1.5 grams will be the total sum of what is going to be absorbed by the calorimeter when it's heated up and what's going to be absorbed by the solution when it's heated up so when we multiply the 4.18 times 200 times 17.9 we get 14,964 but we have to add that to this 13,890 that we get to heat up the calorimeter so the total here is going to be about 29,000 and it's actually 28,854 so this is the amount of heat that's given off by the magnesium when we react it with the acid but that's only 1.5 grams of magnesium but what we need to know is how much heat would be given off if we had one mole of magnesium or in other words 24.3 grams of it so there's a couple of different ways you can do this one way is to set up a ratio and proportion as i said before where you compare uh, in other words you divide 1.5 by 24.3 equals uh, and then it would be 28,854.4 divided by x cross multiply and solve for x or there's another way you can do that and that's just to figure out how many moles is 1.5 grams of magnesium so you would divide how much you have by how much one mole weighs in other words you divide 1.5 by 24.3 because 24.3 is how much one mole of magnesium weighs so when you divide uh, 1.5 by 24.3 you get 0.0617 which i'm circling here at the bottom of the slide so the other way you can do this is you can take the amount that you got here and divide it by the number of moles that produced that amount, which is 0.0617. You're going to get the same answer, uh, and that answer is going to be minus 467, 656 joules, and that's in one for, for one mole of magnesium, which if you round it off is minus 468 kilojoules. Next slide. But right, here's another one of these uh, problems where we have different steps. And this is what we're trying to figure out the delta H for. So this is the way it would be written in your textbook here. Uh, and so what we're told here is that this reaction actually happens in three steps. So the bottom line is we have to figure out some way to add these three things here together the way we've done it in the past. Everything on the left of the arrows, <clears throat> excuse me, and then draw the arrow. And then everything on the right hand side of the arrows. Now, uh, this one is not as easy as the one we did a moment ago. Because for this one, we can't just add them up the way they are right now and get the right answer which is this thing down here we won't get that if we add these together and you can go ahead and try it if you want to we're going to get something totally different so we're going to have to rearrange those three things on the top to get them so that when we add them together we get the thing on the bottom and every time we make a change to one of these reactions here we also have to change the delta h over here so <clears throat> what i recommend that you do for this kind of a problem is that you first of all look to see if everything is on the correct side and here i'm looking at no first okay let's start and go left to right no is only present in this third reaction here at the top right there and it's on the correct side so let's leave that for now and go to o o is on the left on the one down here at the bottom that we want but it's on the right here so we're gonna have to reverse this 
reaction and write it as 2O on the left and O2 on the right, which means that we're going to have to change that sign from plus to minus. <clears throat> and then we're also going to have to multiply it by a half because we want to wind up with only 1O and we have 2 the way it is written right now, which means that this is also going to have to be multiplied by a half. So we're going to have to divide that by 2. So we have to change the sign and we have to divide by 2. <clears throat> okay, and then we're going to wind up, if we leave it the way I just said, um, we're going to have O3 and O3 still on the same side, but we don't want any O3 at all. So we're going to either have to reverse the top one here or the bottom one here to get the O3 on the other side. And I'm thinking that what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to reverse the top one. So if we do that, we're going to wind up with three O2s on the left and two O3s on the right. Uh, so then we'd have two O3s on the right and then this one O3 on the left. Uh, but that's not what we want. We have to have the same number. So uh, we would have to also multiply the one on top here by a half. So we're going to have to basically do the same thing to this one, it looks like. Divide it by 2, and then that will give us um, 3. Uh, let's see. No, that still won't work. <clears throat> because then we're going to know. So it's going to have to be. So we're going to wind up with O2 on the right. But when we multiply that by a half, we're going to wind up with a half O2 on the right. Uh, so we need to have the same number of O2s on the left. So it looks like we're going to have to do some more calculations. So why don't we go ahead and... Uh, so the first one on top here is going to have to be reversed also and then multiplied by a half or divided by two. And that should take care of it. Let's go to the next slide. So you can see this one's a little complicated. So you'll have to hope that you don't get this on a test. Uh, because it's just time consuming. It's not that it's really difficult. It's just you have to keep playing around with it. So anyway, everything that I just said is listed out for you here. So the top two have to be reversed, multiplied by half. Then when you add all of this together after you do those two things, then you're going to get the right answer, which is the thing here at the bottom. So just look this over and I put a little note down here at the bottom right in yellow to show you what you're actually trying to do. I don't know if that's going to help or make it even more confusing than it was, but uh, anyway, the bottom line is that we want to wind up with NO plus O gives NO2. To do that, we had to do some manipulations for these top two reactions here, or mechanism steps. This one here on the bottom, we didn't have to do anything with. We just left it alone. And it turned out that we had to reverse directions and then divide by two. Uh, and then we also had to uh, multiply by minus one for one of them so that we came up with the right answer. <clears throat> so anyway, this one's really complicated, but when you do these steps down here, every time you reverse the reaction, you have to change the sign over here. So if it was minus, you change it to plus and vice versa. Every time you multiply through by a half or whatever, then you have to also multiply through these numbers over here on the right by a half also. So the numbers you want to add up at the end would be these three numbers here after they've been changed. Uh, which means that you're going to wind up with here uh, 2, 1, 3.5 here. You're going to add that to 2, 4, 7 here, and it's a negative, and then add that to the 199 here because this one didn't change because we didn't have to do anything to that reaction. So add these three values together, and that will give you the value for the delta H for the whole thing. So the answer is going to be minus 233 kilojoules. Next slide. <clears throat> okay, this one is two parts. We've got combustion at table sugar produces CO2 and H2O, which we already knew that. Table sugar has uh, hydrogen and carbon in it, and it also has oxygen, but you, you'll also get oxygen from the air. So when 1.46 grams of table sugar is combusted or burned in a constant volume bomb calorimeter, 24 kilojoules is liberated. <clears throat> So here is your clue. Now, I told you that it's very rare that you have a problem where they'll say that it's constant volume, but this is one such problem. 
So for these, the delta E is just equal to the Q. And what's the Q here? It's 24 kilojoules or 24,000 joules. So the Q here is going to equal the delta E. So to find the delta E, you just find Q. Uh, so that's not really a big deal. Um, <clears throat> The only thing is if they want it for the combustion reaction of sucrose, that's when you burn one mole of sucrose. So the only thing we have to do here for part B is we just have to convert it to one mole because when we burned this, we produced 24,000 joules, but it was only 1.46 grams. And sucrose is going to weigh a lot more than that. It's going to be up over 100, I think, for the molar mass for that. So what we'll have to do is we'll have to do another one of these ratio and proportions or just the other way, the shorter way is just to figure out how many moles 1.46 grams is of sucrose by dividing by the molar mass. For part A here, let's do that first and then I'll flip over to the answer. What we're gonna do is we're gonna write C12H22O11 plus O2. And we don't know how many O2s, so just leave a space in front of it and then draw an arrow and then write CO2 plus H2O and leave a space in front of both of those. And then since we have 12 carbons here, probably we're going to wind up with 12 CO2. So I would go ahead and start off by writing 12 in front of the CO2. And then uh, for the H2O, since we have 22 H's here on the left, we'll probably end up with 11 H2O's. So I would write that. I would write um, 12 in front of the CO2 and 11 in front of the H2O and just see if it matches. So we'll look at that in a moment. In fact, let's do it now. So let's go to the next slide. So over here for part A, um, I wrote 12 in front of the CO2. And the reason I did that is because there were 12 carbons here. So I'm assuming that there's going to be 12 in front of the CO2 here because that's the only place on the right hand side where there are any carbons. And then we have 22 H's over here. So the only place we have H on the right is H2O. So I wrote 11 here. Now, sometimes even when you do that, it still doesn't balance. Uh, in this case, though, it did work. And then now the last thing is just count your O's. So we have 24 O's here plus 11 O's here um, is 35 O's. And over here we have 11 O's already. So 11 from 35 is 24. So we need 24 more here, so just write 12, because 12 times 2 is 24. Now for part B, <clears throat> delta E is Q plus W, as we already said. In this case, it's constant volume, so Q just equals delta E. So Q is just going to be minus 24,000 joules, but that's only for 1.46 grams. Uh, so the molar mass is not written out here. So what you would have to do is find the molar. Oh, it's up here. So the molar mass of sucrose is 144 plus 22 plus 176. So it's 342 grams per mole. So you would divide how much you have, uh, 1.46 grams, divided by how much one mole weighs, which is 342 grams. When you do that, you get 0 0.00427 moles of sucrose. So this value here can be divided by 0 0.00427 moles to get the number of joules or kilojoules that you would have if you had one mole. So it turns out that when you divide the 24 by the 0 0.0047, you get minus 5622 kilojoules per molar. If it were written in joules, it would be 5,622,000 joules. Okay, next slide. And again, on any of these, if you don't understand, just email or you can actually call. Just if you call, just uh, try to make it like, if you can, try to make it between about noon and say six or seven in the evening unless it's an emergency. Okay, this is a multiple, multiple choice. So you're supposed to go through the four answer choices first and then see uh, which answer choice down here at the bottom matches up. So regarding state functions and internal energy, the first law says the internal energy total is constant and that's true. A state function's value depends only on the present state is true. A path function's value depends on the present state and the path used and that's true state functions do include internal energy and enthalpy but they don't include work work is a path function so choice d here is wrong a b and c are right so i usually just put a check mark there so it's uh, going to be one two and three which is answer choice e so this one is e next slide <clears throat>
Next. Regarding enthalpy and thermodynamic standard state, the thermodynamic standard state is defined as one atmosphere pressure and zero degrees temperature. So do you remember this? We said it was not zero, it was 25, right? It's 25 degrees, so this is wrong. <clears throat> Two, the thermodynamic standard state for enthalpy is written as delta H standard, that's correct. So let's put a check here. Number three, by convention, endothermic reactions are designated with a minus sign. That's wrong. Remember, it's exothermic, not endothermic, and endothermic would be a plus sign. Uh, and this here is supposed to be a check mark for two. For an enthalpy change measured in standard conditions is called standard enthalpy of reaction. And that sounds okay. So it looks like two and four, which would be answer choice B. Next slide. Uh, next slide. Another multiple, multiple choice with regard to calorimeter, uh, calorimetry. One, the heat of fusion tells us how much heat is required to melt the substance from solid to liquid. That's correct. Specific heat number two for substance tells us how much heat is required to raise the temperature of one gram by one degree centigrade is correct. To calculate the heat required to raise the temperature of a solution by 10 degrees centigrade, we must multiply specific heat times the mass times the temperature change, and that's correct. And then for the heat of fusion plus the heat of vaporization equals the heat of sublimation, so that's correct. So all the above are correct. Uh, next slide. Next. What is delta H standard for the following phase change where we're starting off with the solid form of sodium fluoride and we're ending up with the liquid and so the delta H of this reaction will be the delta H of formation for the products minus the delta H of formation for the reactants and the product is the liquid here so this one minus this one so we're going to have minus 546 minus a minus which is a plus 575 so minus 546 minus a minus which is plus 575 uh, so in other words, what you're doing in essence is you're taking 575 and subtracting away 546. And that's about 29 plus 29. And that's in kilojoules per mole. The answer is going to be in kilojoules per mole. In this case, you might as well just leave it in those units. So it's going to be... Uh, we'll just leave it in those units. So next slide. And here's our answer. Uh, which is just what we said, right? 29. Next slide. At atmospheric pressure and 25 degrees centigrade, what is delta H for the following reaction? If the complete consumption of 56.9 grams of uh, C2H6 liberates, and that's ethane, liberates minus 2952 kilojoules of heat. Um, I just want to point out that for this particular reaction here, it's a little different from the usual because we have two moles of what we're burning here. Usually you wind up here with a one, so we'll have to be aware of that because it's asking what the delta H is for the reaction, which means we need to find it for two moles of this stuff. Um, so when we look here and we see that we burned 56.9 grams of that, we'll have to figure out how many moles that is. And then uh, we're, we're seeing here that it's liberating minus 2952 kilojoules of heat when we burn this much. So the molar mass of C2H6 would be 30 grams per mole. But since we have two moles of it, it's going to be two times 30 or 60 grams. So what we need to figure it out for is how much heat would be liberated if we burned 60 grams. And see, we burned almost that much. We burned about 57 grams. So what we can do is we can either set up a ratio in proportion where I'm, I'm going to round this off for the sake of time. And I'm going to write this as 57 over 60. And I'll show you how to do a ratio in proportion in case you don't know. The way you do that is you, you write the, the two ratios next to each other with an equal sign between them. And then on top, we're going to have minus 2952, and that's in kilojoules. And ordinarily, I change kilojoules to joules, but we don't really need to do that here. So I'm just going to leave it 
is 29.52. And then write another, draw another line and then write X here at the bottom because that's what we're trying to find. And all we're saying here is if we burn 57 grams roughly of this, we get this much heat. So how much heat would we get if we burn 60 grams? That's all we're saying. And I got the 60 by figuring out what the molar mass is of C2H6. And I added 2 times 12 plus 6 is 30. But we have to do 2 because that's the way this reaction is written here. And they had actually written this. I didn't write this. So this is supposed to be a 6 here. So the way that you would solve it, I mean, uh, is called cross multiplying where you multiply 57 times x and then multiply 60 times minus 2952 which obviously you'd have to do that on your calculator uh, and then you would wind up let me just actually go ahead and do this so you'd wind up with 57 x on the left and then that equals 60 times minus 2952 so whatever that is so I mean, I can estimate it. So it would be, let's say, 30,000 times 6 would be about 180,000. So it's approximately 180,000. And that's still in kilojoules. So it would actually be more than that if you change it to joules. So very quickly, oh, 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 here. I'm doing this as fast as I can. It may not seem like I am, but I am. hundred eighty thousand and it's minus so then finish up by just dividing both sides by 57 when you divide this side by 57 the 57's cancel and uh, then you divide also the right hand side by 57 and whatever you get over here on the right hand side when you divide the number that you get it won't be 180,000 it'll be something in that area Wh whatever you got uh, when you multiplied 60 times 2952 and then divide by 57 is going to be your answer. Let's go to the next slide. And it turns out that the answer is going to be minus 3112 kilojoules here at the very bottom. So, and I did this the same way here on this slide that I did on the previous slide, uh, except that I did it um, with the number of moles, but it's the same thing. So um, you do the ratio in proportion this way. Uh, cross multiply and then solve for X and that'll give you your answer okay next slide which of the following is endothermic now remember we said that whenever you're going from gas to liquid or when you're going from liquid to solid that means it's going to be exothermic uh, if you're going from solid to liquid you have to put heat into ice to melt it so when you go from solid ice to liquid water that's endothermic. You have to put heat into it. So whenever you're going up the ladder, if you will, from solid to liquid or from liquid to gas, then that's going to be endothermic. So that's what we're looking for here in this problem. Something going from either solid to liquid or liquid to gas. And here, answer choice B, I can just see evaporation of ammonia, that's going from liquid to gas. So that's probably going to be our answer. So let's go ahead and just tentatively put a check here. Liquefaction of ammonia would be going the opposite direction, where you're going from the gas to the liquid. So you're going down the ladder, so that would be exothermic. Freezing of water, you're going from liquid to solid, that's exothermic. Here, condensation of ammonia is the same thing here as A, it's going from, there, or actually it's going from, yeah, it's going from gas to liquid, so it's going down. And this condensation, condensation of water is the same thing. So uh, these are all not going to be endothermic. They're all going to be exothermic. So the answer is going to be B. Next slide. Um, and then let's go on now and do a couple of more from Brown and LeMay. Uh, next. The value of delta H for the reaction below is minus 336 kilojoules. Calculate the heat released to the surroundings when 23 grams of HCl is formed. Okay, so notice the way that the reactions are written because you'll need that to do these kinds of problems. So these are like combination of stoichiometry and some other things. So for uh, delta H for this reaction is minus 336, where we're producing three moles. Notice that we're producing not one, but three moles of HCl. And so in terms of the mass of that, uh, that's going to be about 35 roughly grams per mole if I'm remembering correctly, 
Uh, so CL, I believe, is 34.5, and then H is 1. So if we round that off, 3 moles of that would be about 100 and maybe 5 grams. And so what they're asking us to do is they're saying if 3 mole or producing 3 moles of HCl uh, is going to produce also 336 kilojoules, how much would it be if we only had 23 grams? So uh, here, if we have about, let's say, 105 grams, and I'm just multiplying 3 times whatever the molar mass is for HCl, if we had about 105 grams, we'd produce this much heat. So it's another one of these ratio and proportion problems. So what we really need to know is about approximately what the ratio is between 23 and about 105. And that's a little bit less than 1 fourth. Uh, actually, it's more like 0.2. So if it's 0.2, then, I'm, and I'm just doing this as an estimate. We'll look at the answer in a moment. Uh, that would be what, uh, 6, 70, uh, 67, so about 70 kilojoules is what we should produce if we only burned 20 or if we only formed rather 23 grams of HCl. If we only formed 23 grams here instead of the 105 or whatever, then we should wind up with about um, that much heat being released to the surroundings. So let's go ahead and go to the next slide and we'll look at this in more detail. So uh, again, I set up a ratio in proportion where I'm putting the ratio of these two moles. Uh, so here I put, uh, well, let's go back up to the top. The molar mass, it's actually 36.5 <clears throat> rather than 35.5. because uh, So chlorine must be 35.5, and I was thinking it's 34.5. So uh, the ra ratio is going to be between this number right here. So 23 grams is how much we have divided by how much one mole weighs, and that's 0.6 moles, roughly, 0.63 moles, roughly. Uh, but here we have three, so we want to do a ratio in proportion between the number of moles for 23 grams versus the number of moles in our reaction. The, so the three here is coming from that reaction above. So uh, if we did it with 0.63 moles as opposed to the three moles that we had initially, and we know that if we did it with three moles, that this is how much heat we would produce because we were told that up here in the problem statement. So what we want to know is how much heat would be produced if we only had the 23 grams. So just call that X because that's our unknown. And again, here we have a ratio in proportion. So you cross multiply. So multiply minus 336 times 0.630137 equals 3X. And then whatever you get when you make that multiplication, divide by 3, and that's going to give you your answer. So you divide both sides here, but divide that by 3, divide that by 3, and you get that X is 70.57 kilojoules, which are rounded to 70.6. .6. All right, uh, so any questions, again, just email or call. Next slide. Uh, and here we have another problem like this. So when one mole, and I'm kind of just reading through the problem here, when one mole of sodium hydroxide dissolves in water, we produce heat. Now, this isn't a reaction. It's called making a solution, but it still produces heat here to the tune of minus 44.4 kilojoules for every mole. So in other words, if you had one mole of sodium hydroxide and you dissolved it, you would produce all of this heat, minus 44.4 kilojoules. So now again, they're doing the same thing they've been doing in the last couple of problems. They're saying, what if you don't have a whole mole of NaOH? What if you've only got 13.9 grams? So we have to again do a little ratio and proportion. So we need to know how much NaOH weighs, and then we have to figure out how many moles 13.9 grams would be, or that's one way we could do it. So uh, Na is 23016 H is 1. So 23 plus 16 plus 1 is 40. So this is 40 grams per mole. So if you wanted to convert this, you would divide 13.9 which is how much we have by 40, which is how much one mole weighs. So divide 13.9 by 40, which that's going to actually wind up being about 0.333, right? And then you would multiply that times your minus 44.4 here, and that'll tell you the heat that you're going to give off with only 13.9 grams. You see that? So uh, first of all, find out how many moles you have. And then realize, okay, if I had one mole, I'd put out 
minus 44.4 kilojoules, but I don't. I have about a third of a mole, so I'm only going to put out about a third this much. But figure out exactly what the number is. And then whatever that number is, you're going to set it equal. And let's see if we need to worry about the calorimeter here, and I don't think we do. So whenever they don't specifically tell you the, the, the heat capacity for the calorimeter, just forget about it. And down here, I've got a note that we're supposed to assume that the coffee cup calorimeter is a perfect insulator. So just forget about it. So assume that all of this uh, heat is going into heating up just the water. So this is water in a coffee cup calorimeter. So um, our formula is that delta H equals the mass times the change in temperature times the specific heat. OK, so I'm going to go ahead and kind of like try to write that out real quick. We're right at an hour, so we need to stop as soon as possible. But I think this is the last problem. So it's the uh, mass times the delta T times the specific heat, which I'm just going to write as a lowercase c. So delta T C. And the C is going to be 4.18 joules per gram K, which is the same as we've been doing. Delta T is what we're trying to figure out, right? Yeah, so we'll leave that for now. And then the mass, you have to be careful here because it's like the problem we did before where we dissolved the um, magnesium in the water, the acid. But in that case, they told us to assume the density of the solution was one gram per centimeter and there were uh, one gram per cc rather and there were 200 cc so we assume 200 grams in this case they don't say that so what we're going to have to do is add 13.9 to 250 to get the total mass which is going to be 263.9 and that's going to go right here so 263.9 and we'll know what the delta h is when we divide or multiply whichever way you want to do it so this is 263.9 grams. Uh, when we divide minus 44,400 joules or minus 44.4 kilojoules, uh, either divide it by the ratio or, or multiply it by how many moles you have. So I guess it would be easier just to multiply it by the number of moles. So it's going to be times like 0.333 or you could divide by 3, whatever. Let's go to the next slide anyway. So when we do this little thing, and it turned out to be 0.3475, so it wasn't exactly a third, but it was very close. So 0.3475 moles times minus 44.4 kilojoules per mole. Moles are going to cancel, and you wind up with about minus 15.429 kilojoules. So that's going to be what we're going to put in here for delta H. Uh, M is going to be 263.9 here, uh, specific heat, which I wrote it as S here, but I, usually you'll see it as C, is going to be 4.18. And then the delta T is what we're trying to figure out. So let's go ahead and do this division. And we're going to see that the delta, eight, uh, sorry, the delta T is about 14 degrees centigrade. So uh, that's basically it. Yeah, that's basically what we needed to find out. Now, that isn't the answer, though, because they want to know what the temperature is going to increase to. So if it was originally 23 or at 23, then you add 14 to 23, you get 37, or about 37. Um, so 23 here, so 23 plus 13.98 rounded off is about 37 degrees centigrade. Look at the answer choices here, and there's 37 degrees centigrade right there. So the answer choice is going to be D. All right, so we're a little over an hour. Let me go to the next slide. So uh, I actually went longer on this than I intended to, but we did a lot in this chapter, more so than we have in the previous chapters. So anyway, uh, we have one uh, chapter left that I have still to do, and then I'll be done with the 1311 videos because I ended up doing the last half first because of the way the semester turned out in the spring. So I've, I've got to do six uh, lecture notes and six work problems and we'll be done. And then I may, if I have time, go back and do a video for the math introduction to the course at the very beginning of your lecture notes. But that'll depend on how much time I have. So anyway, this one, we did quite a bit of work here. So uh, it's probably enough for you to be able to get through this chapter 
But again, as always, if you want, you can go to Mr. Mac's website or other websites and do some more practice. So thanks for watching, and I'll see you in Chapter 6.